guys are here, and if you're joining us on the other side of the monitor this morning, I want to say a special good morning to you guys as well. Hey, today we're going to start this series that we're calling Add To. And uh, so before we dive into that, uh, especially if you're here for the first time, I kind of want to let you know, and it's really important that you know where we've been because we're not leaving where we've been. We've just come out of this series that, we've, that we're calling Unclutter. And what we've been doing is we've just been asking God helping us to basically remove some of the clutter that accumulates and builds up in our lives. It can build up in our theology, it can build up in our heart, it can build up in our, in our soul, it can build up in our mind, it can build up, uh, it can, it can build up in our past, it can build up in our, in our calendars. And what we've been doing is just saying, God help us. Help us unclutter our lives. And what we've been uncluttering specifically is just like our worry, our doubt, our stress, our fear, our anxiety, the lies that we believe. We've been uncluttering our unbelief. We've been we've been uh, uncluttering maybe these these false beliefs that we have. We've just been, Lord, here's what we want you to do. You just want us to help us be the church that you've created us to be. Well, what does that look like? And so over the past six weeks, actually probably more like seven, we've been memorizing, look at this one passage of scripture, these two verses of what Paul said it looked like to be the church. Like he wrote this letter called Romans to the church, and we've just picked a couple of passages, a couple of verses out of it, and uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2, and we don't even need to throw it up on the screen because let's be honest by now. I mean, you've got it all, man. I mean, so say it with me if you know. It's Romans 12, 1 and 2, and it's the message version. And he just says, Paul just simply says, hey, here's what I want you to do. God helping you. I want you to take your everyday, ordinary life. I feel like I'm saying this all by myself. I want you to take your sleeping, your eating. There you go. Awesome. Way to go. You're you're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work, you're walking around life, your ordinary life. And I want you to place it before God as an offering, Embracing what God has done for us is the best thing that we could do for him. Let's not become as a church, as a people, so well-adjusted to culture that we fit into it without even thinking. Instead, let's, as God's children, as a church, let's fix our attention on God and he'll change us from the inside out. And we will be able to readily recognize what he wants from us and then we can respond to it quickly, unlike the culture around us, which is always dragging us down to its level of immaturity, God desires to bring out the best in us and develop well-formed maturity in us. You guys, if you want to know this journey that we're on as a church, that's it right there. It is to be that church that would say, God, here's my life today, from my sleeping, from my eating, from my going around work, uh, going around life. And I'm going to give it to you as an offering, embracing what you have done for me is the best thing that I could do for you. And God helping me, I am not going to fit into culture without even thinking about it. Rather, I, as a child of God, will fix my attention on you. So you'll transform me from the inside out so that I'll know what you want me to do. And I'll have the courage to respond to it quickly. That is the mission. That is the goal. That is where we are heading as a church. And so that's where we've been, and we're not walking, walking away from it. Rather, what we're going to do today is we're going to start this new series. We're going to add to it. We're going to add to it. And this, where this series actually comes from the book of 2 Peter chapter 1. And so if you have your Bibles there, what I want to let you know is we're going to Head over there, Second Peter chapter 1, and we'll get there uh, this morning, I promise. In fact, we'll get there very quickly. But we're going to add two. Now, I don't know how it was for you growing up, but one of my favorite memories as a kid, one of my favorite things, and we didn't do it very often in our home, but this is something that I always look forward to. In fact, I bet that there's some grandmas and grandpas that love this. In fact, I bet that there's some parents that love this. I bet there's some of those of you that you've got memories of this as a kid or you're creating memories for your children because this is just fun. Do you remember when you're like infant baby or maybe, you know, maybe it was you and you could, you could actually stand and grandma, grandpa, or mom and dad would say, hey, here's what I want you to do. I want you to come over here and I want you to stand against the wall. I know it sounded really weird at first, but then they took something like this out, this tape measure, and they started measuring you at two years old. And at two years old, you were two feet. And so somewhere on your house, maybe it's a door, maybe it's a wall, what your mom, your dad, your grandma, your grandpa, somebody, or maybe you're doing this for your kid, just wrote Mike Fackler, two years old, and he marked it on the wall. 
And then all of a sudden, he, Mike Fackler turned three. That was a really long time ago, like 40 years. And uh, then right here, they marked Mike. Here's Mike at three years old. <clears throat> and then like, oh, here's Mike at like four years old. And then Mike turned 18, and then I started growing this way too. It was really weird. Uh, but uh, anyway, you could go back and you could look at that. And like where you started, mom and dad and grandpa and grandma, they would just keep adding to and it was really fun. It's even fun now to be able to go to the house and you can see where they did that because what it does is it shows you how you've grown. This series right here, this add to series, is going to show us how God's growing us. This series we're adding to Romans 12, 1 and 2 is all about maturing in our faith. It's all about growing. It's about adding to and you'll be able to see how God's growing you. You'll be able to see how you're maturing. And here's what I want to let you know. I am so, so excited about this series because I really believe God's going to do something awesome in our church, awesome in you, if, he'll, if you'll let him. Like he wants to, but we're going to have to give him permission to. And I'm so excited that we get to be a part of this journey together of being this church that Paul describes in Romans. And Peter is just going to simply add to it. And so here's what we're going to do. Here's, here's what we're shooting for. We want, to, we want to experience the full measure of our faith. We want to possess a faith that not only saves us, but that when people see us, when people encounter us, it are just by being who we are in Christ, it would draw other people to Jesus. And by the time Peter writes this, he's matured. I mean, you remember Peter when we first meet him, man. We meet him, he's a fisherman. That dude's down by the seashore and he's a fisherman and he encounters Jesus and there's this awesome miracle. And what I love about the life of Peter is you get to start traveling with him in the gospels and we're there for like all of his bold attempts to please God. We're there for all of his like missteps and things like that. And you know what? God in his faithfulness allows Peter to write two books in the New Testament. So if you ever feel like you don't have it all together, like God's never going to be able to use you, listen, Peter is living proof that God can use anybody. And so is Mike Fackler. <laughs> That's why I love Peter. Okay, so he, at the end of the, uh, he, Peter gets to write these two books, 2 Peter chapter 1. This is Peter's take on what it, it, what it looks like for Christian living. This is his take at Christian living. And uh, he's matured in his faith. He's grown. He started here, but he's grown in his faith. And so here he is uh, just sharing with you and I this morning what it looks like to add to and, uh, and having this faith that is matured. He speaks, his divine power has given us what? His divine power has what? Given us what? Wait a minute, because I bet somebody walked in here thinking that you were missing something. But you see, it's God in his goodness has given his son Jesus Christ, and God in his divine power has given us what? Everything. Like this morning, if you have a personal relationship, relationship in Jesus Christ, you have everything you need right now. For what? For a godly life. You have everything that you need for godly living this morning if you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. God has made himself known. You have this relationship with Christ and the spirit abides in you. You have everything that you need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and by his goodness. Now through these things, through our knowledge of God, through our, that knowledge producing a faith, producing a relationship, he's given us very great and precious promises. Promises like, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. Promises, I will be with you. Promises, I go to prepare a place for you and I will bring you back to me where we'll be for, together forever and eternity. He's given us very precious promises so that through them, we may participate in his divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the, in, the, uh, in the world caused by evil desires. Now, because God has given us everything, because of our faith in Jesus, we have everything we need for a godly life. What Peter is telling us to do, he says, for this very reason, I want you to make every effort to add to your faith what? And to goodness, and to knowledge, and to self-control, and to perseverance, and to godliness, and to mutual affection, love. Peter says, 
as a follower of Jesus Christ, I want you to add to your faith these things. And then look at, look at what he says. He says, for if we possess these uh, qualities in increasing measure, they will keep us from being what? And, whoa, so if we have these, if we possess these in increasing measure, it'll keep us from being ineffective and unproductive in our knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, in our faith. But whoever does not have them is cannot wait to talk about, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers, sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling, to confirm your election, for if you do these things, you will never, and you will receive a what welcome? Into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now in church circles, here's what we call what we just read from Peter. We call that a really good word. That is a good word. So if we go to, if we just look at three and four real quick, let me just paraphrase what Peter's saying. Is that if you have a knowledge of God that has produced a relationship with God, that if you have faith in Jesus Christ, you have everything you need for godly living. Meaning that faith has saved your soul. It has produced this faith that can save you and has the potential to draw other people to Jesus. That faith is complete. That faith is lacking absolutely nothing. It doesn't need anything else to save you. It has made you right before God. That is saving grace. Your faith, your relationship, your confession that Jesus Christ is Lord, it is complete. That's what he's saying there. But then he goes on and he says, hey, here's what I want you to do, though. I want you to add to your faith. And we begin to get this list. And we're going to take five weeks and we're going we're to look at this list in an extensive, um, extensive nature over the next few weeks. But let's just look at them briefly. He starts with goodness. Let's add to your faith goodness. What is goodness? What is biblical goodness? Here's what it is. It's moral excellence. It's doing what's right. And when you know God, when you have knowledge of who God is, you have a personal relationship with God, you know the difference between right and wrong. You know the difference between good and evil. And you choose God. You choose good over wickedness, over evil. And so Peter's saying, hey, listen, you know the difference between good and evil. You know how to please God. You are now to add to your life goodness, moral excellence. Let me just give you an example, telling the truth. Who knew telling the truth would be so hard sometimes? Who knew being honest could be so hard sometimes? But that is an example of moral excellence. Let me tell you, let me give you one that escapes the church uh, just because it doesn't feel quite as good, but it doesn't make it any less good. Is correcting one another. Is correction. You know, I think about what Paul wrote to Timothy. Just talking about how the word of God is alive and active. It's sharper than a double-edged sword and how it's useful, man. It's useful for teaching, for instructing. It's useful for correcting. It's useful for rebuking. Somehow in our, in our PC culture, one of the things that we fail to do as a church is be willing to hold one another accountable. That's not looking for high, moral high ground. If we're not doing that, that's not love. Moral excellence, just, a, just an example. Moral excellence, doing the right thing. I think doing the right thing is correcting a brother or sister if they're out of bounds. Peter's saying, I want you to add to your faith goodness. And then he goes on to say knowledge. I want you to, he says, I want you to add to your faith knowledge. You see, there was a moment in time where somebody told you that God loves you. There was a moment in time that somebody told you that God loves you so much that he gave his one and only son, Jesus Christ, that, whoever, that, that uh, whoever would believe in him would not die but have everlasting life. That's where your faith journey began. And according to Peter, God, in his goodness, revealed himself to you, and you believed the truth. But that was where our journey with him began. And now what Peter is saying is, I want you to make every effort to add to your faith knowing God. And not just knowing God, but I want you to align your life with him. Sounds like Romans 12, 1 and 2. I promised you we weren't going to get away from it. You see, what, what, Peter's, what Paul was saying is, here's what I want you to do. I want you to fix your attention on God. And if, when we fix our attention on God, he will transform us from the inside out. And then we will readily recognize what he wants us to do and respond to it quickly. That's what knowledge is. It's knowing what God wants us to do, aligning our lives with him, and then going after it. Add to our faith that. 
What pleases God in doing it? And then Peter goes on to say, hey, here's what I want you to do. I want you to add self-control. Now, I bet everybody in here has a plethora of that. So you should share it with the person next to me, next to you. Forget that. Just share it with me, okay? Self-control. Add to your faith self-control. Self-control is God helping you. It is bringing your passions, it's bringing your desires, it's bringing your thoughts, and bringing it under the authority of Christ. It is making every thought obedient to him. That is self-control. It is saying, okay, if I go over here, am I going to go out of bounds in my faith journey? Is this going to be displeasing to God? See, I'm going to have self-control. Listen, for those of you guys who are in a dating relationship and that thing's getting a little bit steamy, man, that thing's getting physically a little bit too far. Teenagers, you know what I'm talking about. Young people, you know what I'm talking about. Singles who have been married who are thinking about getting remarried, you know what I'm talking about. You got an opportunity for self-control, bringing your passions, your desires, your thoughts back under the authority of God. Self-control. You know, somebody's going to have an opportunity to exercise self-control driving on outer drive today because somebody is going to be doing 45 miles an hour in a 60, and it's going to make you think things and say things. Oh, I'm going to watch the Detroit Lions, Lord willing, today. It will be an experience in self-control. Okay? All right. I'm just saying Peter's saying, here's what I want you to do. I want you to add to your faith self-control. And then what he says, I want you to add to your faith perseverance. I want you to add to your faith perseverance. Some of you guys today are really facing some, some monumental things going on in your life. There are some things in your life that you wish weren't there. And you don't need me to sit up here and list them because you know exactly what they are. And you know exactly how they feel. And what Peter's telling you today is he's saying, I'm not asking you to get through the next 48 hours. I'm asking you to get through the next 12. And I'm asking you to add to your faith perseverance. But see, the beauty about the perseverance that he's talking about is he's not asking us to do it in his strength or our strength. He's asking us to do it in God's strength. You see, this type of perseverance is God helping me. God helping me, I'm not going to give up today. God helping me, I won't give up hope. God helping me, even though I'm suffering, and that is not too strong of a word, even though I'm suffering, I will trust you, God helping me, I will add to my faith perseverance, and I'll trust that you've got it. So today, really, if you're striving, man, don't just strive. Trust that God is carrying you in the storm, persevere, okay? All right, I could preach, I could preach a whole message on this, and in a few weeks, I think I will. Okay, all right, anyway, godliness. Add to your faith godliness. Godliness is pleasing God. It is the act of faith in action. It is not just knowing what God wants you to do. It is the fulfillment of. It is the recognizing what he wants you to do, and it's the back half of it, responding to it quickly. It's not just knowing what God wants you to do. It's living it out, okay? Then we get into mutual affection. Mutual affection is brotherly love, okay? I would define it this way. Mutual affection is unity, it's unity. See, our family, there may be discord, but it is our family that pulls us together. There's supposed to be a love that is there in our family. Now, you've heard the expression, you can pick your nose, you can pick your friends, but you can't pick who? Your family, man. You can't pick your family. <laughs> and so, listen, guess what? We can pick our, we can pick our nose, we can pick our friends, but guess what? We, we don't always get to pick one another. And what Peter's saying here with mutual affection is, guys, we got to find unity. we got to find unity together. You guys, this is a big deal. I'm just going to tell you, like, this is what God's been just, I just keep coming back to this thing over and over and over again. And I'll just share, share with it of, like, what it means to be the church. And I, I won't give you the exhaustive list, but here's what, here's what I, my, my mind and where the Holy Spirit just keeps taking me back. He keeps taking me back to this, like, encourage one another. Pray for one another. Forgive one another. Bear with one another. Mutual affection, unity. Anytime, a, anytime there's discord here, discord with other believers, what Peter's saying is, I want you to add to your faith mutual affection, unity. And unity might not feel good. It might not feel great. But it's an opportunity for us to trust and to embrace 
our relationship with Jesus. And, and he, get this, you don't have to do it on your own. You don't have to manufacture this. Why? Because God has already given you everything you need for this. All right, and then love. Brotherly love, philos love, and then we've got the best kind of love, agape love, which is just unconditional love. That's what he's asking us to add to our life. And then here's what he says. He says, for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being what? And unproductive. I'm going to get to that in a minute, but I just want to be really clear here. That list that Peter added, some of you are thinking, okay, I've got to do these more. I've got to do these more because I want to be saved. That list right there is not saving grace. That list that Peter just gave us is a byproduct of our faith because our faith has already given us everything that we need. But our faith should create a thirst and a desire to be a part of these things. And God in his goodness has given us everything that we need to do this. So when you look at this list, this list is not something that we're simply, that is outside of our faith that we're adding to it. It's already a part. It's already there. We're growing into that thing, okay? And so what Peter says is Peter's saying, you've already got all that you need. And as you mature in your faith, like as you add goodness, you're going to be growing. As you add, as you add uh, self-control, we're going to be growing. And it should be in increasing measure, that we, it should be evidence, meaning it should be visible. Like we ought to be able to see this actually growing in our life as we add to. As it grows, it's a growing thing. It's maturing. It should be evidenced right there. And he says it will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in our knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. None of us want to be ineffective. Here's what I'm telling you. The add to faith is an effective faith. It is an effective faith. It is a productive faith. If you look at who Jesus Christ is, you look at how the disciples lived their lives. Things happened when they gave their everyday, ordinary life over to Jesus. The Spirit of God moved. And, and let me just talk about that for a minute. You see, it is our job as a church to take our everyday ordinary life, our sleeping, our eating, our going to work, our walking around ordinary life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what he has done for us is the best thing that we can do for him. And in the midst of that, we're supposed to add to our faith goodness. Add to our faith in those moments self-control. Add to, add to our faith in those moments perseverance. Mutual affection love. We can't produce those moments. God will produce the opportunity. There's going to be an opportunity for some of us today where we're going to be faced with the choice of lying or telling the truth. God's given us that opportunity. It is our job to add to our faith moral excellence. There's going to be an opportunity for us today to add self-control God's going to provide that opportunity. We don't have to manufacture that opportunity. God's going to provide it today. It is our job in that moment to know what he wants us to do, to respond to it quickly, and to add self-control in that moment in increasing measure. Does that make sense? That is our job. God's job is to provide the opportunity. It is our responsibility to add to and to step into that moment and to follow through in our faith and add this list that Peter has for us. And if we do that in increasing measure, it will keep us from being ineffective and unproductive in our knowledge of Jesus Christ. If we add this to, it will keep us from being ineffective as a church. It will keep us from being ineffective as followers of Jesus. Aren't there enough people who are just filling seats in church but nothing else is going on in their lives? Nobody, when I look at you, when I think about you, when I pray for you, I don't think of people who are just filling something to do in 60 minutes. I think about a person who desires that. I think about a people who desires that and, and it just, it, it's not up to me. Pray like crazy that you would add to as God presents opportunities so that we would be productive and effective in our faith. 
that the kingdom of God in Casper and Wyoming and through his church at Highland Park around the world would be known as a people with an effective and productive faith where people come to know Jesus, where miracles happen in Jesus' name, and where needs are met in Jesus' name. You see, earlier today, Chris Kinner stood right here, and he just presented an opportunity. God presented him an opportunity. What you heard was an announcement. What you heard was Chris say, hey, if you got an extra jacket, if you got an extra coat, there's somebody who could use it. That was not an announcement. That was God creating an invitation for somebody to respond and say, hey, there's some goodness I can do here. Hey, somebody needs some help. I'll do that. Pray that we would possess this with increasing measure so that we would be productive. Because after all, an add to faith is a productive faith. It's a faith that saves us and draws others to Jesus. Okay, now look at verse 9. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted in what? Forgetting that they've been cleansed from their past sins. Whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Who's Peter writing to? He's writing to followers of Jesus. They already have everything that they need. And yet Peter's saying, if you don't have this, one of two things is happening. Either you are a brand new follower of Jesus who is an infinite best... Or you're nearsighted and blind. Now, I don't know how to speak Greek. If we were to go over to Greece together, you would be in big trouble. Because I don't know how to, I don't know how to speak Greek at all. But if you were to look at the original language, if you were to look at the Greek word for blind, and I'm going to absolutely butcher it, okay? I probably won't, but here it is. The Greek word for blind that Peter is using right here is called myopizon. Myop, myopizon. Write that down. Myopizon. Listen to what Peter's saying. Whoever does not have these is nearsighted and blind. They are myopizon. Here's what that means. That means that you have deliberately and intentionally shut your eyes. God has given us everything we need for godly living. If this list does not exist, if there is not evidence in our lives, that word unproductive, that means there's no fruit. If it doesn't exist, and didn't Jesus say that we'd be known by our fruit? That you would be able to identify us by how we live? That's what it means to be productive. That's what a productive faith. And Peter is saying, whoever does not have these it's not that you don't have them, it is that you have chosen not to. It's not that we don't have them, it's that we've chosen not to. Listen to that. Have you ever chosen not to? Not to forgive? Not to serve? Not to exercise self control there's something beautiful about a 3 month year old baby 3 month old baby who lacks self control it's kind of cute there's nothing beautiful about a 43 year old man or woman who lacks self control demanding their own way have you ever have you ever not to on purpose have you ever closed your eyes because i'm telling you i have And when I, when I understood the totality of that phrase, when I understood what me, being blind really meant, like I deliberately closed my eyes, like I had intentionally not to, I just started begging God to forgive me. Like it just collided with any pride that existed and it showed me the error of my ways and I just started saying, Lord God, please forgive me for those moments I chose not to. Have you ever not to? Because Peter's saying, whoever doesn't have these things in increasing measure is nearsighted. And it's not because God hasn't given them to us. We've just chosen not to. And 
we've forgotten. We've been cleansed from our past sin. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, comes back to it. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to make every effort from this moment forward to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these things, God's given you everything you need. Your faith has saved you. It's created a thirst for. It's created a desire for. When the moment arises, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. You will never stumble. Now, what Peter's talking about is, you know, is he saying we'll never sin again? He's not saying that. He's saying you'll never stumble. You won't ever have to worry about will I make it to heaven or not. Now, I want us to remember, we can't earn our salvation. Remember what Paul says? Paul says, for it is by grace you have been saved by, not by works, so that no one can. Okay, so we've been saved by, we've been saved by grace, by faith. It is our faith that saved us. But what Peter's saying is, is if you possess these in increasing measure, you just need to know, you're good. You're living for Jesus. Don't sweat it. And then get this. And you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What does a rich welcome look like? I don't know. Here's what I think it looks like. I think it looks like Jesus standing before you. And I think what it sounds like is hearing the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Now I want to try to be careful here, but I want to be honest here. There are people in our country, I, I think the number, the statistic is somewhere between 68 and 70 some percent of people who claim to be Christians and yet there is no evidence of and they're counting on, they're banking on, they're going to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. But they've, but they've been spending their entire lives deliberately choosing not to. If you're here today, hear my heart on this. God has given you everything you need if you have a personal relationship with him for godly living. I can't put want to in you. I just don't want you thinking that just because you're here today or you don't miss a weekend that you're good. Because Peter is clearly saying our faith, people should know us by our faith. It should be evidenced by this list. And as Highland Park Community Church, that's how we need to be known. Not for where the church meets, not for what time we meet, but who we are as a church, a church that would take our everyday ordinary life, our sleeping, our eating, our going to work, our walking around life, and we would place it before God as an offering. Embracing what he has done for us is the best thing that we could do for him. And when he provides an opportunity for goodness, we step into it. When he provides an opportunity for self-control, we step into it. When he, provides, when he provides an opportunity to know him more knowledge, we step into it. That's what we want to be known for. And so today I would offer three challenges. Maybe for you today, you need to begin a personal relationship with Jesus because what you thought and where you thought you were isn't really where God sees you as you are and you need to really begin a faith. For others, maybe this week what we need to do is spend some time repenting and just saying, God, please forgive me for choosing not to. Don't just simply walk away from that one. I think all of us here, myself included, need to really engage our personal faith. And as we have this day that he's given us, our sleeping, our eating, walking around, or going to work life, we look because our attention is fixed on God. We recognize what he wants us to do and we add to and respond to it quickly. That's where we're going over these next five weeks. And I hope you won't miss one of them. Lord God.
Your Holy Spirit, do what you want to do. I want to say thanks for a chance to open up your word. Your word promises it won't return void. Lord, uh, I know that your Holy Spirit speaks in ways that we cannot. For those of us who need to repent, please, I just want to say thank you, God, for receiving uh, that prayer. And I want to say thank you for the forgiveness that you offer us. Help us live in that. For those of us who need to begin a personal relationship, Holy Spirit, speak in these moments. Draw people to yourself. Help us be the church that you have created us and called us to be in the power of Jesus' name. Amen.